All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Clemente Diaz. I'm one of the uh, co-chairs for the CUNY IO Practitioners Network. If you're new to the group, uh, the goal of the CUNY IOPN is to expose CUNY administrators to IO psychology research, theory, and practice. Um, and if you don't know what IO psychology is, in short, it's the psychology of work. Um, and today we have yeah, two very like an special hosts. Uh, We're like an anchor. Your, yeah. Please move yourselves. All right, there we go. Um, we have two um, individuals who have presented for, for the group uh, in the past. We have Dr. Sai Islam and Dr. Gordon Schmidt, who will be talking today about developing our leadership programs using pop culture, specifically the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So very interesting topic, and I'm sure you'll have a lot of takeaways in terms of developing your programs either with staff or with students. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sai and Gordon. Thank you very much, Clemente. I really appreciate the invite. We love uh, visiting with the CUNY IO network. Uh, this is lots of fun. So very, very happy to be here. Uh, so just wanted to, you know, uh, let everybody tell us a little bit about themselves. So tell us a little bit about who you are. So in the chat, if you can do us a favor, uh, you can put your name, what role you happen to have. If you would like to share your LinkedIn profile and connect with other people in the CUNY network, uh, strongly recommend that, that you do that. This is a you know wonderful group uh, to be a part of, so make sure that you connect with those folks. And then is there a leader in popular culture that you'd be most likely to follow? Um, you know. Uh, and if, is there, you know, the, outside of outside of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Gordon, is there a pop culture leader that you would, you would like to follow? Um, I would like to follow uh, Indiana Jones um, because he's still bringing it as a professor at eighty, apparently, still going on adventures, and I just want to still be able to do that next week. Honestly, I don't know if I'm as physical fit as <laughs> as Professor Jones is. <laughs> There we go. Still, still punching Nazis all these years later. Uh, still have a need for that, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. So I was, you know, I was going to say, um, you know, if we, we had a pop culture leader that I would, I would like to follow right now. Uh, I don't know if anybody watches uh, Abbott Elementary. Um, I, I might want to follow Ava Coleman uh, just, just to see how she prepares for disasters. Um, lots and lots of fun. Uh, and Clemente, you, you, you want to follow Aang. That's what our next book is about. So hopefully um, you're, you're ready to, to follow that. Um, let's see, we've got Peter uh, DeKeel. He says he's an academic advisor. Uh, he wants to follow Professor Snape. Wow. Yeah, uh, I mean, let, let's face it. I mean, they got most outcomes out of their classes in Snape's, right? Uh, Fencing against the dark arts. <laughs> uh, yeah, Snape he, feels like a tenured professor to me. I got to say, I agree with that. <laughs> He, you know, he just wants to teach that defense against the dark arts class and nobody is letting him, right? This is a common problem among um, among faculty. All right, let's see who else we've got. Uh, Anthony DeRosa, okay. All right, so feel free to tell us who you would like to follow in popular culture. We're going to be talking about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but there is quite a bit of, you know, other, other areas in, in the universe. Hora, so, oh, wow. Uh, that good, is great. Good, also, Avenger, uh, uh, Avatar the Last uh, Airbender uh, fan here. Very, very cool. Oh, and Clemente has also been helpful enough to put a LinkedIn group for the CUNY IO Practitioners Network. That's, uh, that is wonderful. Right? Let's maximize that platform. Uh, let's see. Any other oh, suggestions? Shira. 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 Oh, Shira. Oh, yeah. I have not seen the new Shira, but I've heard it's good. It's pretty good. Yeah, I'm behind, but it's good. Okay, okay. And and Gordon being very controversial right now, hashtag real avatar, you know, are you not going to follow the way of water? Sign, I've talked a lot about this upcoming movie, and I don't want to see uh, the avatar too, I'll tell you. But oh, and Renee... Titanic too, I would have seen, but avatar. <laughs> very cool. All right. And Mar Marlon mentioning Wednesday Adams. I have not seen that. I think, Gordon, you've watched uh, Wednesday. Um, we, we got one episode left. So okay. we're, we're, okay. we're getting there. Yeah, okay. I, I do like the Adams family. Uncle Fester, more of my type of leader. But. Okay, all right, very good. And Renee mentions Queen Raimonda. Uh, uh, if you've seen Wakanda Forever, that is a very, very good pick, very strong pick for, uh, you know, for a pop, pop culture leader that you would follow. Uh, Angela Bassett absolutely carrying the film uh, for a big portion of it. Uh, so great, great choice. 
Let's see. All righty. Oh, wonderful. And, and so many people from so many different parts of CUNY, um, really happy to be able to, uh, to be here and to talk about uh, this, especially because of all the excitement around being able to think about leadership in kind of a new and unique way. All righty. All right, so you can continue to you know, put your LinkedIn profile or give us suggestions of pop culture leaders that you'd like to follow. You can find out what Gordon and I have seen, what we haven't seen uh, you know, in terms of, of pop culture. But let's do a quick intro of ourselves and let's talk about our, our nerd bona fides here. Uh, so I'm Dr. Sai Islam. I'm an associate professor in the psychology department of Farmingdale State College and also vice president of consulting uh, Talent Metrics Consulting, and a huge nerd that has uh, brought my wife along with me into nerddom. She watches all the Marvel movies with me. Uh, and then I'm going to hand things off to Dr. Gordon Schmidt. Um, I've exposed my wife to many Marvel movies as well as my sister-in-law, and they in no way want to see them uh, and are not happy about it. They're there. Uh, that I could only get Disney Plus because I, I had a book contract related to those movies. So... Uh, I'm looking to write more books on whatever streaming sites I want to then uh, sign up for next. So hit me up if you got ideas. Um, but yeah, so just looking at that, um, you know, I've been a, a fan of Marvel Comics for my life. The movies, um, I even put my kid here, little Dimitri is wearing his Marvel shirt. Uh, and I've got some, actually got art from a local artist of Vision from a, a famous scene in the Avengers you can see in the background there. Um, I, I co-edit Management Teaching Review, a journal as well, um, and I'm at the University of Louisiana Monroe, just started here June 1st. Um, and so, yeah, we love we love these movies. We love all kinds of nerdy stuff. Uh, the Sandman series was great recently on Netflix as well, uh, if you haven't seen that one yet. And, uh, you know, I think, I think your blog posts about Sandman are the reason that we're getting a season two, Gordon. So, <laughs> uh, you know, congratulations on that. Check out the Talent Metrics blog. I just made a link. We've made a few of these pop culture uh, ones, some for Marvel, some for Sandman, one for Rings of Power, I think, as well. Rings of Power, and then also what we do in the shadows. So if you haven't seen that. Oh, yeah, that was, I was going to say that was fantastic, but I wrote it. So I don't know whether that's just arrogance or it's something at least. We'll, we'll call it confidence. We'll great work. Confidence. Great work by me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very cool. So we've got, you know, we just wanted to show everybody what big nerds we are. And uh, I think it's a lot of fun to talk about this stuff. And I can sense even from the text in the chat here, how much passion there is for the stuff that people like. I think that's one of the things that is uh, really cool about pop culture and about kind of bringing some of the IO ideas into the world of pop culture, or at least recognizing where and how they happen to fit within the world of IO psychology. Alrighty. So let's pose the question of why. Yeah, so why, why the MCU? Why, why talk about this and leadership? Um, and you know, I think to me, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is just a great way to illustrate a lot of things that affect us related to leadership uh, and sort of interact with others. Um, and so in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you have all these superheroes uh, and others with great skills. Uh, we've got people that can save the day on their own in various ways, um, but they have to come together and work together for a greater goal. Similar to how we all have different skills, right? We all have different ways of doing things uh, and things we're good at. Uh, and with Marvel, we see that as well as these people have different perspectives, they've got different skills, different philosophies, but they've got to figure out how can we come together as a team. Uh, Iron Man on his own, Hulk on his own, can't save the day. We need these, these people working together uh, with their differences in that way. And to me, that is what our workplaces are about. We have different skills, different perspectives, sometimes very different goals. Uh, and using that, those differences, that diversity, to help us reach greater heights is what we should be doing. Uh, and so when we're thinking about leadership and uh, leadership and trying to make it accessible to people, come up with good examples. To us, Marvel was a great medium to do that. It made perfect sense uh, because again, we're also looking at leadership. 
this idea of influence, not just we got a boss and we listen to them, uh, which is often how we see in the pop culture. You know, if Elon tells you to do something, you do it. You don't quit Twitter, right? That's just how it works. But as we know, that's not how life works. Uh, we are influenced by other people. We influence people too. Uh, and so the Marvel Universe is a great example, a lot of more informal leaders and leadership and followership as well. Uh, and we really built that into this book we wrote, and we build that into a lot of the discussion we have related to these topics, um, because we think it's important for all of us to be effective at leadership and to learn about it in an engaging way that's understandable. So that's, I think those are the big items on that. All right, very good. So now that we know why we're interested in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we've got to ask this question because this is something that came up in the conversations that um, that we asked Clemente actually to reach out to the CUNY IO Practitioner Network just to get a sense of some of the things that uh, people might want to uh, want to talk about. And so one of the big questions that came up was this idea of whether or not the material was appropriate, whether or not um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe was actually the right thing. And so one thing that happens sometimes, especially if you're dealing with like student groups or if you're you know, trying to develop student leaders, or even if you're trying to develop leaders among your colleagues um, and your, um, you know, your, your, you know, fellow coworkers at CUNY, is you want to connect with them. And so if, if you want to use pop culture references, you kind of have to know whether or not this stuff is going to be appropriate. And I'm just going to ask this question uh, to everybody. Um, you know, how many of you are conducting needs assessments for your programs? Uh, you can put it in the chat, yes or no. Uh, how many of you are conducting needs assessments prior to implementing your programs? All the time. So Clemente, very good to hear that. Uh, Shamika also mentions that, that you know, she's doing needs assessments. This, this makes me feel very good uh, because I give, con you know, I give presentations for uh, other groups uh, other organizations where there is training or learning or things like that, that that's happening. And the most depressing question that I ask is, oh, did you do a needs assessment? So if you look at uh, some large organizations, some big companies from around the world, they're running lots and lots of different trainings. And then all of a sudden uh, you ask them, like, did you think about whether or not this was the appropriate thing to do? Did you conduct a needs assessment? And they just look at me like, no, we don't have time for that. So thank you uh, for running needs assessments. You can include in your needs assessment, you can say, well, okay, I can use this to figure out if pop culture references you know, are appropriate. But just to play devil's advocate for a bit, and you can put this in the chat, what are some reasons that you think pop culture may be appropriate for your program? What makes pop culture useful? Not just the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but you know, what are some reasons that you think might, you know, pop culture might be helpful in the programs that you're running? Let's see. Okay. So for students and attention grabbing. Okay. So uh, Gordon and I, both professors. Uh, Gordon, do you think your students don't, sometimes don't pay attention? Uh, I've, I've sometimes, I, I try to be engaging 99% of the time, but that 1%. You know they're out they're on their phone instead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just one percent. You know th those numbers are not reversed. Yeah, so as professors, we know getting that attention is tough. You know, very very challenging. Uh, Anthony mentions it gives a point of reference, right? It gives them something to reflect to, to connect to. So <clears throat> when we think about pop culture, it's not everything in the design of the development of our programs. It is a way for us to either grab attention, build a connection. We're gonna talk about where that connection comes from. Another way to kind of evaluate whether or not pop culture is, is useful and appropriate is to collect data on previous sessions that you've run. What kind of data do, you, know, do you have available to you about your programs? And I'll put this question in the chat and hopefully some of you can respond. Yeah, what kind of data do we have uh, at our fingertips about the programs you're running? Uh, 
And this can be all kinds of stuff. It could be about learning. It could be about signups. It could be about persistence. All right. So Clemente mentions he conducts pre-post assessments and uses that data to inform future versions of the program, almost like he went to an IO psychology master's program. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, figuring out pre and post, you know, you can measure uh, learning. You can measure, you know, whether or not people are, are happy with the program. So Renee mentions event satisfaction surveys, which help us to focus on student needs. This is very, very common, maybe the most common form of assessment that's happening. But, you know, um, when you're looking at event satisfaction, what are some things that are in your survey that might indicate to you that you may want to use pop culture? Any ideas about that? So as you're thinking about this, I want you to have this consideration in mind that using pop culture is not an inevitability, despite what Thanos may tell you, <laughs> right? You want to consider whether or not this is an appropriate thing. If you are presenting to a group of deans, this may not, you know, it, it, it may not work. You may not need to do this. If you're presenting to potential students, this might be helpful. If you're, you know, presenting to students, you know, current students or freshmen, you know, sophomore, whatever, this may be a way to gain engagement, to get them involved and excited about the material that you're covering, especially when it comes to something like leadership. All righty. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how to use this in the classroom. Yeah, and so for the book, there's a number of ways the book can be used in a classroom. Um, you know, the we 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 had somebody actually use the book in one of their classes on effective teamwork, actually. Uh, and so she talked within that class. They went through the various chapters and talked about okay, how does this help a team to do well? Uh, so you can use sort of the full the sort of the full thing, a full thing. Uh, but also this can be something where you grab chapters or elements. So we're trying to teach about shared leadership or bases of power uh, for students to think about. Um, we talk about stress. So how do you deal with stress? Well, that's something where you might grab a chapter and a movie um, and use that as a good example base uh, for what you're doing in, in a course or that type of thing. Uh, you know, at the college level or even at the high school level as well, coming up with these engaging examples or engaging clips for a topic of value. So uh, I'm sure many of you in thinking about student programs have done things about stress management, right? Uh, something like talking about stress management and heroes could be something that makes it appealing and makes it more understanding. Um, and so thinking in that direction for audiences, I think is very helpful. Uh, in graduate school as well, you can go beyond what might be in the book and have people come up with their own examples of pop culture or develop them out or show another version of a type of leadership, whether talked about or not. Um, and so the book has a number of educational settings uh, in terms of where it can be used in terms of normal types of class type setting. Gordon, it's funny that you're that you we're talking about using this in a grad school course, uh, because my my recall of grad school courses is not this exciting in any way, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And I think part of the reason that we're passionate about bringing pop culture into uh, the classroom and into these settings is because of our experience in, in graduate school, where it just wasn't uh, it was pretty dry, and stuff like this would have made it a little bit more interesting for for me, and I'm I'm sure you. Uh, they told me in graduate school to not talk about pop culture so much. So I decided to make it my career. <laughs> <laughs> Take that, Take grad that. school advisor. <laughs> uh, if, if anybody couldn't tell, we're, we've got a lot of axes to grind, and I guess the book huh? is the way to get it done. <laughs> there we go. All right. So one big thing, all of this kind of boils down to this idea of learner engagement. Uh, and that's a big issue that we see in a lot of organizations, especially, you know, colleges and universities, and especially with optional programs, volunteer programs that uh, people might be a part of. 
So one of the big challenges that we see is this idea of training fatigue, right? Sometimes uh, students, they're taking courses, they're sitting in, you know, sessions already, they're already taking classes, they, they might uh, be experiencing some sort of changes, right? Um, you know, they might be seeing multiple changes across those courses, whether it's online, whether it's something in Zoom, they might have to learn all sorts of new things. So they might be burning out a little bit. And so getting them to come to optional sessions or additional sessions to learn new things might be a bit of a challenge. So I'm, um, I'm an advisor here at uh, SUNY Farmingdale. Uh, I am one of the uh, advisors for the Muslim Students Association. And one of the challenges that we face is getting people to attend face-to-face -face virtual um, meetings. And that's one of the things that we see is that with many students, they're, they're kind of burnt out, both in terms of face-to-face -face and virtual sessions. So how do we get them to be excited again, to show up to the kinds of sessions we see? Uh, another thing that we see very often is this idea of quiet quitting. How many of you, you could just put this in the chat, how many of you have heard of this concept of quiet quitting? Okay, all right, so let's see. Uh, Gordon's heard about it, luckily. Erica says she's heard about it. Stephanie, yes, it's been discussed a lot recently. Uh, definitely hear it pretty often now. Okay, uh, yep, Anthony mentions that it's become pretty popular. It is actually popular. Does anybody know where this idea came from? Just to, you know. I'm gonna highlight some of the reasons why we wanna make sure that we have engaged learners. No, Marlon's not sure, okay. So the original did evolve for the pandemic. The wave of the great resignation. Okay, okay. So the original concept, the original phrase quiet quitting came from a TikTok video, which is kind of funny uh, because quiet quitting as uh, IO psychologists, we would refer to that as disengagement, right? Uh, but quiet quitting seems to be the phrase that's, that's taken hold. And you may not know this, but students, um, you know, university workers, they can quite quit too. Um, and that just kind of means that you're not as engaged. You're not willing to put in any of the extra effort to participate in activities, participate in things that are happening on campus. And we really want to have students and uh, you know university employees have great experiences on campus. This is one way to do that. What are some indicators? So earlier we talked about doing these needs assessment, uh, but if we're thinking about learner engagement, we want to see how their um, how their engagement looks, why their engagement looks the way that it does. The post-training feedback that we talked about earlier is a great way to kind of get, get that. If you have like student engagement surveys or employee engagement surveys, that's another indicator about whether or not they're engaged in learning. If they, it, you know, if employees are telling you, I'm not doing optional training, I'm not, even, I don't even want to do mandatory training anymore. You know, that's a big sign to say that, okay, maybe we're not seeing as much engagement as we have in the past. <clears throat> Performance appraisals of employees can also be an indicator uh, that they're not as engaged in, uh, you know, learning, you know, uh, in, in as much learning. You know, as faculty, we know when students aren't as, as engaged because they may not be showing up to class. They may not be engaging as much in the work of, you know, uh, of an online course or regular, you know, face-to-face -face class. And that may be asking them a little too much. So very, very interesting to see that. And then one thing that we might consider as an indicator is do we have enough people in the leadership pipeline? You know, if we're thinking about student leaders, I'm thinking about this now, uh, you know, I'm, I advise student group and I'm wondering like, do we have somebody that's gonna step up and become the next leader? Do we have that level of engagement where people are involved enough in the group that they're going to, take that next step, take that, be a part of that next stage. And so this is one of the big considerations of, you know, why we might want to consider learner engagement and what learner engagement actually means. So, you know, we're talking about this idea of engaging learners, keeping them committed, keeping them interested in what's happening within, uh, within the world of the college and university. <clears throat> what do we mean when we say learner engagement? Well, there are a couple of things. So learner engagement could be academic. 
right? Just, hey, are students learning the stuff that we expect them to learn? Are they learning the material that we expect them to learn? Some of it may be cognitive. Are they taking in the ideas, the concepts that we want them to take in? Are they having the thought processes that we expect them to have as members of this university community? Are we seeing the behaviors that we expect to see? So there's a behavioral component to learner engagement, right? We talked about showing up to class. That's a behavioral measure of learner engagement, right? Uh, are people showing up to meetings? Are employees showing up to meetings, right? Uh, are they committing to actually doing that? So that's a behavioral example. And then there's the affective piece. <clears throat> are they enjoying the learning process? Are they getting something out of the learning process? What is this process like? And so one of the things that we really want to consider is there's all these different elements of learner engagement. And when you're thinking about using pop culture, we have to think about uh, what part of learner engagement we really want to engage in. In the same way that when you're writing your instructional objectives for a course or for a training program, you really want to think about, well, how, you know, how do I want to uh, get people interested? How do we connect with folks through this instructional objective? You know, what am I trying to get, get across to them? We want to do the same thing in terms of our consideration about the use of pop culture or the use of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in getting these student learners learning. Okay. Gordon, what, what should student le leadership development programs have? Uh, yeah. Um, so I think that's a question that makes sense here. I'm going to throw it out to the group as well uh, in terms of what do your student leadership programs look like. Um, I think there's a lot of different elements we can have, right? We want students to be prepared. Uh, we, we look at them as people that will one day, and, and while their students can still be having impact on the world and on others around them. Um, and so we see this through things like apprenticeship or mentorship programs. Um, this can be paired with mentors, you know, at the at the university. It can be ones in their desired career path, uh, that type of thing as well. Uh, internships as well, potentially fitting as this type of development uh, of leaders. Uh, we can do training, so degrees or classes. So I've I taught in a program of leadership. I teach a class about leadership now. Um, we can certainly have formal classroom training and degrees, but also programs or things that people take. Uh, one university I did a guest lecture for, they were doing self-leadership. So they had a class all about how do you lead uh, yourself? How do you, how do, you do that uh, in significant ways? And really that, and our book itself has a lot of that self-reflection, um, self-awareness pieces as well. Um, coaching people, whether it's related to their particular area or field or something they're doing, uh, can certainly be pretty relevant. Um, you know, universities, we're seeing a lot more of e-learning modules, right? Uh, various trainings where we're having people go through examples or learn particular topics. Um, you see Christine in chat talks about uh, workshops about success and leadership roles on campus as well as careers. Uh, I think that's really important because I think students can engage in a lot of leadership on campus and it can apply in the real world. It's actually very valuable experiences. Uh, and so students having an impact on campus can also lead to them having even more impact in the world of work as well. Um, and certainly we might see virtual related trainings in various way, virtual instructors or virtual worlds or game related things. Um, we're seeing more of that stuff like the metaverse as well. Um, the metaverse is a bit of a hyped fad <laughs> at the moment. Uh, but when we think about its goals, there are a number of companies doing trainings where they have virtual leaders or virtual facilitators that are actually very helpful in learning. Uh, company Tailspin does a number of these related to leadership and other training as well. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities in that direction too that we might use at the university level or develop uh, too. Um, and so as we're going through programs and doing this, we wanna figure out what's the mix that makes sense for us and what's gonna engage students. Um, I think sometimes we just think student engagement is if we offer pizza, they will come. Uh, and while that is very true for me because I definitely love pizza a lot, uh, 
you know, we want to make sure we want something that the topic draws in students significantly and they feel that they've gained out of it. They, they understand what what's going on. All right, so here's another way to think about learner engagement. And this is just a model uh, that I like to talk about, especially because of what Gordon mentioned. He talked about the design of the program, all the things that you're currently doing in your program and where you know pop culture might fit in. But what I'd like you to do is think about what your training content is. What is it that you're trying to communicate to your learners, whether they're students, whether they're faculty, whether they are other uh, you know, colleagues within the CUNY system? What is it that you're trying to get across to them? What is it that you're trying to communicate to them? And then, you know, is it information? Is it some sort of new practice? Is it a skill? What is the training content? Looking at the training content, then we need to think about the presentation, right? What is the, you know, what are the activities? What's the central metaphor that you're using to kind of communicate this material? You know, what's the modality? Is it classroom? You know, face-to-face -face classroom? Is it a virtual classroom? Is it asynchronous e-learning? What is the, the process procedure we think we want to be there? How are we presenting it? And that is where really pop culture, any kind of pop culture, but specifically the Marvel Cinematic Universe comes into play. How are we presenting this material? What information are we presenting? And how could we use that pop culture to make these ideas pop, to really communicate these ideas more clearly? So notice the Marvel Cinematic Universe is not like changing any of the content, but it is an additive that can improve the presentation, which then in turn allows us to hopefully see greater learner engagement. Learner engagement meaning greater commitment to learning, actual understanding and, and, and knowledge increase, and then the desire to practice. So when you're looking at your programs um, next semester or next year, we can, if you can start to break it down into these different pieces, these different steps, we can start to say, well, okay, what is the content that I have? What is it that I'm looking at? What is it that I'm trying to present? How am I presenting it? What is the approach that I'm using? And then does that approach lead to that learner engagement? Does it lead people to learn more, to be more committed to the learning, to practice more of this after the training is done? And can we identify that through some of the data that we, that we had? And so you'll notice that we're looking for indicators that will tell us whether or not um, learning is actually happening, whether or not people are actually gaining knowledge. And we're using this pop culture almost like you know, an enhancement, like a little flavor enhancer to bridge that gap between engagement and actual learning, okay? Uh, and you'll notice that we've been using this term pop culture pretty often because even though we love the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we do acknowledge that there are other types of pop culture that are out there that could be used in a similar fashion. Uh, we've just found from our experience uh, teaching courses that you know Marvel seems to be a very engaging way for people to learn a variety of things. All right, so I'm gonna hand things off to Gordon to ask us again, why are we using the MC? What makes it unique in terms of pop So, uh, I, you know, so, sort of some big buckets we might think about this is uh, the MCU is a big area that people are very familiar with uh, in a culture that's more and more fragmented over time. Uh, the Marvel movies are something that does connect a lot, a lot of people together. Um, I think that when we use things like the MCU, it, it provides certainly that idea of references so that people know that they've heard of this, whether through the movies or through various memes. Um, but I think as well with good, carefully crafted films, uh, there's that emotional connection, right? Is watching these films, they're engaging. You care about what's going on and connecting to these things, whether it's through clips or watching movies themselves, uh, gives you another level of uh, emotion and caring about it. Because um, we can talk about concepts like leadership uh, and, and, you know, make them in a way that people don't find that interesting, or we can talk about CEOs and students may not feel as connected or that they can do it. But with these heroes and their fail, their own failability and their sort of more personal connection, uh, it leads to more of that emotional connection, uh, that feeling of interest in what's going on. 
Uh, and so we see kind of that as a big area of why the Marvel Cinematic Universe in particular can be a good base uh, for things such as this. Uh, and it's continuing, it's going on, it's continuing with interest. It's not that it's over or, you know, with Avatar, we'll wait 20 years between movies or something and hopefully everyone still wants to see it, uh, right? The Marvel movies keep going. And with that sense, uh, it gives sort of connection and continual interest. They, they are the puff daddies of pop culture. They won't stop, they can't stop. So, but speaking, speaking of dated references, if anybody remembers my PDD references, then, then congratulations. So for the purposes of, you know, uh, of, of leadership, how do we define leadership in, uh, in our book? Well, we have a much broader perspective on who and what a leader happens to be. So a lot of times uh, students, you know, em uh, employees, they tend to think that leadership means that you have a job title that says that you're a leader. But the way that we envision leadership is, is an influence process. And uh, this is a direct quote from our book, that it's influencing other people and helping them to accomplish important things by working together. We can accomplish more than what we could accomplish individually as we see with superhero teams like the Avengers, X-Men, and the Guardians of the Galaxy. And so you can see that the idea here is not just that, well, this person is CEO, this person is the team lead, this person is the manager. Anybody can have the kind of influence that, that, that we're talking about within the world of work, within the world of school. The question is, will you use your influence to improve things or not? And so that's, that's what we really want to communicate to everybody about this particular idea. Right. See. So let's talk a little bit about how we ended up uh, writing Leaders Assemble and how that can inform how you use it in your own, uh, in your own courses and in your own programs. So when we think about this, we, the way that we approached it was we looked at the leadership content, meaning what theories, what approaches are we going to be talking about? Uh, for example, we have a chapter about shared leadership. So we define what shared leadership is, which is um, when a team doesn't have a formally designated single leader. They just kind of trade uh, you know, leadership across people. We look at the Marvel Cinematic Universe and we say, oh, okay, I remember we watched Guardians of the Galaxy and the Guardians of the Galaxy, they don't have one single leader all the time. They switch leadership depending on what the task is that needs to be done. So we tie that to a Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, you know, situation. And then we ask readers to self-reflect. We say, okay, let's watch the film. Let's journal about it. Let's write about it. Let's talk about it. And so that's what we've basically done. And that's what we would suggest that you do for any of your programs, uh, whether it's using our book or using some other pop culture, is to think about, well, what is it that you're trying to communicate? What is it that you really want them to know about leadership or another topic? What's the example that you want to use? And then coming up with an activity or something that they can do that would help them to connect to that material. Okay. All right, so Gordon, what should these pro programs cover? Well, and I think it depends on what you're trying to do, uh, but things like, uh, as we see in here, something like conflict management. How do we best come to, you know, whether it's conflict management with your you know, college roommate, uh, whether it's people in your job or in your program. Those are all things that are very useful skills for our people to learn. And leaders have to be able to deal with conflict management um, or you know, maybe most of their workforce will end up quitting and they won't be able to do essential functions, right? We need to retain that and do that. Uh, and so that's we cover that in the book related to the movie Captain America Civil War. We talk about some of these conflicts on the Avengers related to who should run the team and how it should work. Uh, and then ultimately not dealing with that conflict well leads to a lot of problems for the team. Uh, and I think that's one thing is these, the heroes are failable in what they do. They make mistakes and we can learn from those mistakes as well. Um, and we certainly, we learn from our own mistakes too. All right. I, I'll have you know, I have never learned from my, my mistakes, Gordon. 
It's good. Mm-hmm. Consistency. That that's what I'm all about. Consistency. Reliability there. <laughs> all right. <laughs> So one thing that you'll notice is that we've been using this metaphor of the Marvel Cinematic Universe pretty consistently. And one thing you'll notice that that happens within organizations is that they will sometimes have a concept or an idea that they'll carry through the entire organization. So their training programs at the individual level, the group level, the organizational level, they all echo those same concepts, those same ideas, whether it's innovation at Google, whether it is you know, um, a commitment to customer service of Disney, there are central metaphors that you can use to kind of uh, discuss the same concepts across organizational level, group level, and individual level. And you might find some really interesting and fun ways to use the Marvel Cinematic Universe at an individual level, talking to a student and getting them to reflect at a group level, running a session uh, or a class session and, and getting a group to agree to a particular idea or concept or then using those same concepts in multiple trainings and then seeing those changes happen at the organizational level. And so we can see that this metaphor um, using pop culture can be very, very popular, uh, very powerful in getting uh, alignment across individual group and organizational level programs. One example uh, that we've talked about in the past is uh, that of Captain America and you know, if I had to, I'm going to throw this out there to everybody. What leadership theory do you think best describes Captain America from the list that we had earlier? All right. So Clemente says servant leadership. Okay. That's interesting. He's a servant leader. All right. So servant leadership, for those who don't know, is basically a leadership theory that says that a you know a leader's main goal is to serve their followers and to help them get the work done. Any other ways you might describe Captain America's leadership? No, it looks like it looks like just servant leadership so far. All right, so let's. Let's talk a little bit about how we might use this sort of thing in classroom training. What are some ways, some techniques that we can use this? All right, so we talk about how managers, they generally construct leadership through this idea of storytelling, right? There's some research that seems to indicate this. You can use Uh, these clips in a traditional classroom, or for those who don't know, VILT stands for Virtual Instructor-Led Training. Uh, How many of you have considered using a book club uh, as part of your programs? Let Let me throw that question out there. So perhaps something in, in student leadership, but there is some research that indicates that book clubs are actually really useful ways of getting engagement from learners. We know that a lot of book clubs are kind of what we call airport books. And when we were writing Leaders Assemble, we wanted to make sure that we snuck in a lot of good leadership science. Uh, And then uh, a lot of training programs end up using this stuff as supplemental reading. We know that for executives uh, and for college students as well, reading is is a very important uh, skill. Uh, For those of you who remember the 90s NBA, you might recall reading is fundamental. Uh, so very, very important skill for leaders to leaders to have, um, really key. And then assigning films as homework. Ha- have you ever, has anybody here ever assigned, uh, you know, film as a homework assignment? G- Gordon, did you get pizza for reading books? That is, that's incredible. I just get a lot of pizza to be fair. You, you just get a lot of pizza. I mean, you know, in, in New York City, we should be using that as more of a reward, but you can definitely assign a movie or a film as a uh, you know as an assignment for students in their classroom training as a way to break things up. All right, Gordon, is 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 Marvel the only uh, type of pop culture that we talk about in leadership? Oh no, there's actually a whole bunch of other books as well. Uh, our particular book series has books on. Uh, Middle Earth, uh, Star Wars, and uh, Harry Potter, both 
All three of these books are excellent books as well. Focused in different directions, they all do come from our different discipline backgrounds, our own perspectives, and so they give you different, different foci, foci in that particular way. Uh, Cy and I, as well, are working on a book on Avatar, The Last Airbender, and leadership, uh, looking at more multicultural related elements, looking at more shared leadership as well, uh, more of a balanced perspective, and so that's going to be a lot of fun uh, to do as well. Again, you want to pick a pop culture that fits with the group that you're talking to, that fits with you know, sort of the goals of what you want to focus on. Uh, so, you know, the movie Jaws might not be the best leadership movie for everybody, but if your small town is being menaced by a shark and they won't close the beaches, Jaws and leadership might be a perfect movie uh, for, to learn leadership as well uh, for you. And so figuring out what works for your own group, your own interest is, is important. All right, so we've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Somehow, miraculously, we've timed this so that we have exactly 10 minutes left for Q&A. Are there any questions uh, that you have about using these in, uh, in your programs, using you know, pop culture, using our book or any of the other books that we've talked about? Uh, you know, we're, one of the reasons that we were so excited to come back and chat with everybody was we really wanted to help kind of answer and refine the use of pop culture uh, you know, for these programs. One thing I'll say, Sai, is, uh, and I see Anthony mentioned it in the chat box in terms of potential challenges uh, in using book clubs because of the particular population uh, mm -hmm. you know, attendees may uh, may focus on. So, in, you know, I know you mentioned one, but other ways of mitigating those potential implementation challenges. Mm -hmm. So there, there are two, yeah, I have a couple ideas and, and Gordon, if you've got a, a, a few, I'll let you hop in. One reason the MCU is so uh, useful is there are actually a lot of clips on YouTube that are easily accessible to lots of people. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I don't usually, I'm not shilling for Disney Plus uh, for people to like, oh, you need to buy Disney Plus if you're going to be taking this, this course. I, I don't want to do that. Uh, but there are YouTube clips that specifically target things that are available to, to students and that they could watch and reflect on. Um, I know Anthony asked this great question about, you know, book club may not do it, um, you know, uh, but there, there may be other, you know, there may be other ways to kind of manage a book club, having them post in a message board, having them read the book and, and do self-reflective activities and do that journaling that we talked about before. Um, and Gordon, you're right. We can't, how can I miss the Willow TV series uh, on Disney plus? Did you, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think it's a question of, you know, I think with virtual connections, it's easier in some of these things to do than ever before. Um, and so, you know, the, our book is available virtually. The movies are available streaming. And there's a lot of pop culture that can be shared relatively easy through YouTube and other things. So I think you can definitely have, you know, a large internship program or people all over the globe, but those people can connect a lot easier through those types of tools and things like webinars here. So I'm in Louisiana. Uh, you guys are in New York and maybe other places as well. Uh, those things can help to make, uh, the, we can still connect through a lot of different technology and still be very successful in it. And things like the book or the pop culture comes through a few different ways too. Absolutely. Any other questions? And actually the implementation question is a, is a good one. Um, you know, I, I'd be interested in hearing how programs get implemented in the CUNY system, uh, because that would definitely, you know, help us to kind of think through, you know, what implementation issues you might be facing and, and how to address those. I can definitely ask another question. Okay, all right. <laughs> so kind of following this trend of how to organize these type of programs, obviously conducting a needs assessment, getting a better understanding of what the population you're working with needs in terms of training and, and things like that, um, moving on to the program itself, but then really understanding the effectiveness of your program. I know one thing that tends to run rampant uh, across organizations and even higher education, what we call in IO psychology, smile sheets. Right. So what's a good strategy to make sure that the data being collected um, is actual 
is actually beneficial um, and can lead to positive outcomes in a, you know, another iteration of a program. So I want to mention one thing, uh, you know, usually when we think about um, assessment and things like that, we tend to think of it like at the end of the program, but really one of the big things is what are your instructional objectives, right? What, what do you expect people to be able to do? And then what criteria is most relevant? One of the reasons that we use smile sheets as much as we do is because that's what administrators want. They want to be able to say, well, you did 10 programs and of those 10 programs, it, you know, these, these programs got a four out of five on a post event satisfaction survey, right? And that, that's good, but you can look for other indicators of outcomes. So are you seeing, you know, I mentioned earlier this leadership pipeline. So are you seeing more student leaders, more people wanting to be student leaders? And then are you looking, when you look at those student leaders, are they more effective? Are they staying longer in leadership roles? Uh, you know, what is it that, that we really want to see? Um, and then, uh, you, know, at the, you know, at the larger school level, <clears throat> if you look at um, graduate, graduation surveys, are we seeing them hi highlight those students? Are they talking about the quality of the programs, quality of the student leadership programs? And then do alumni mention that they feel like they gained something from these, these optional programs? So think about that cascade of where uh, students are going to behave, you know, going to be changing or, or behaviorally showing improvements. You can even talk to the student activities committee to see if those student leaders are doing better. Are they managing things more effectively? Stuff like that. Gordon, did you want to add anything? No, I think, you know, I think with a lot of assessment, there is the easy way and then the long-term way that shows learning in that. Um, I, it's hard. The hardest part is starting up. Uh, but when we get, set, get processes going, to be able to say this is really the impact of these programs is helpful because, you know, this is higher ed. There's often shrinking budgets. There's often new leadership that wants to shake things up. Uh, to be able to say, this does work and we can show it is very helpful. Um, and I see that all the time where the argument of why something works, we might feel it works, but the argument, we don't have good data. And so it just takes one person or one administrator saying, well, that don't mean anything to run into issues. And so I do think that data pace is really important as best we can to show something works versus, well, we got a few students to it, which might not have the same meaning. Thank you for that. Um, does anyone have any questions? If not, I'll leave you know it to you, Sai and Gordon, in terms of any final thoughts. Um, kind of a big key takeaway in terms of today's talk. Um, well, I want to say that I'm really excited to see all of these learners in this room with us today, and the people watching at home on video that they're actually engaged in the learning process. And the, the goal for you should be to get your student learners, your colleagues who are involved in your programs to also be just as engaged as you are and try to meet them where they happen to be. Pop culture, Marvel Cinematic Universe is one way to do that. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about broccoli. So as a kid, I heard you're supposed to eat broccoli. I, how did I eat broccoli? I just took it straight, you know, right off the thing cold, tried to eat it. That is that is horrible way to do things, right? The broccoli never wanted it, would eat two at a time, two and then be done at like little stock. But taking that broccoli and you know, boiling it, putting in seasoning, putting in something, broccoli is delicious, everybody, but it has to be seasoned well in the right area. Sai so came up with a metaphor just in these three seconds, isn't that great? Um, that, uh, that to making that broccoli is like that leadership thing, that conflict management thing you want to teach students. Yeah, we can say it's really serious and present it in the most boring, unappealing way, and they are going to throw it out and eat the candy bar of unrelated TV shows. They're just going to watch the Kardashians and move on with their life when they could be learning leadership from the, from the Kardashians. They could be leading leadership from that pop culture. We just have to figure out the way to cook the broccoli that makes it delicious, but still so nutritious. So thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate the time that both of you took to uh, speak to us today. Um, and for everyone watching, as a you know, friendly reminder, we'll send out the recording 
um, once it's done processing, um, as well as the presentation slides um, and some other resources that are already posted on our website. So again, thank you very much um, for joining us.